the seven deadly sins of risk management. Or to be more precise, the seven deadly sins of risk management accompanied by pictures of my holidays. Given that the theme of this conference is around making better decisions through risk management, I thought it might be useful to step back a little and consider the kinds of things that actually stop risk management from being effective in the real world. So the good news is this presentation will not include any talking heads, uh, nor will it include any graphs, pie charts, or diagrams with lots of arrows moving purposely, purposefully across the page. It's just advice culled from more than a quarter of a century trying to make risk management useful to some of the biggest companies in the world. Oh, and I really have included pictures of my holidays, partially to help you relax and absorb what are sometimes quite hard messages, but also because they are occasionally weirdly relevant. Enjoy. The seven deadly sins of risk management. Number one, I can't believe it's not risk management. There are a lot of things called risk management that aren't about managing risk. Not really. They're about regulatory compliance. Great lumps of reporting full of traffic lights and whizzy diagrams and reassuringly large amounts of time and cost. But not really about protecting your business. They're charming people, regulators, but they're interested in the market as a whole, in protecting customers and in other nice things. The truth is, though, they don't really love you. And to meet their primary obligations, we'll happily see you and your shareholders burn in hell. Other things that are called risk management are about financial accounting. Again, lots of work and getting closer to predicting the business through some of the more recent innovations like the viability statement. But the end, in the end, your auditors are mostly about validating a set of numbers. And as the recent fines and penalties have shown, they have their plates full just doing this. What you have to bear in mind is that the prayer of your auditor is for your business, not for prolonged growth and prosperity. It's don't blow up in the next 12 months in a way that can be traced to the accounts. Things called risk management can also be a bad, good old-fashioned ass covering. And any big corporate transaction will come with a long list of risks, helpfully provided by your lawyers, and usually a great cost. As well as lawyers, other professional advisors will highlight their concerns after taking your money, and within your own company, canny managers will slip their worries into the footnotes and the appendices. Protection is being provided, but not to you or to your business. The illusion of risk management can be dangerous for boards because it gives the impression that you're meeting your fiduciary and legal obligations without really giving you the protection that, uh, that actual risk management provides. So sin number one, I can't believe it's not risk management, where things that look like risk management don't really manage your risks. Sin number two, overly mechanistic approaches, or what I call steampunk risk management, the dangers of models that are too mechanistic. The universe is complex, and we are pattern-seeking creatures, so we manage, to manage complexity, we simplify, we generalize, we tidy up, we put things in boxes. We do this because creating simplified models is what allows us to get out of bed in the morning. That is to say, to get out of bed without feeling the need to test whether gravity will work today. So it's clear that it's not just appropriate to simplify, it's actually vital. You can't get anything done if you're not prepared to model, at least at some level. But the problem with risk management is we sometimes lose track of the fact that our models are approximations. And we fall for what we think is, what I think of as a, as a clockwork universe delusion. We start acting you know, that is to say, we start, we act as if the universe is so mechanical that our spreadsheets and nice neat parameters really do give us a full and accurate picture. We start acting as if our models represent eternal truths rather than what they really are, which is generalizations and generalizations from limited historical data. And that's the problem. Norbert Wiener, a US mathematician and the guy who invented the term cybernetics, said the best model of a cat is another cat, actually preferably the same cat. This was way, his way of banging home the simplification point. So we really have to keep that in mind. When you acknowledge this, then you recognize that models almost never embrace the size and complexity of the populations that they're trying to simulate. And we should therefore use them with due humility. And this humility means learning from where the real world doesn't fit with the model. Doesn't fit means you go back and change the model, not hope that the world will come back and fit the model better. It means that we need to iterate when we get new data, and we need to continually revisit our parameters and assumptions. 
It also creates the more difficult obligation of communicating these limitations with our clients, whether these are internal or external clients. And this can be difficult and time-consuming, but it goes with the job. The bottom line is that we need models, but they shouldn't become a cult. George E. P. Box wrote, All models are wrong, but some models are useful. And that's where we are. By the mid-18th century, science got beyond the point of believing that risk the universe works like a giant clock, and we risk managers need to do the same. Okay, so that's sin number two. On to sin number three, lying to yourself. We deceive ourselves for a variety of reasons. Uh, firstly, we are prey to illusions. There are a number that can affect us in managing our risk, but I think the most common is what is known as the illusion of knowledge, where we think we know or understand things better than we actually do. And a good way to under test your understanding of anything is to play the why game. Uh, so you ask yourself, why does something do what it does? And each time you answer that question, ask yourself why again. Yes, it's childish, but every layer you peel away makes you realize the limitations of your understanding. Limitations, by the way, that made me realize that even something as seemingly simple as a flush toilet is considerably more complicated than I thought. Try it. And, and try the same exercise with collateralized debt obligations. That's tricky. There are other illusions too. Sometimes uh, the illusions operate unconsciously, even but even then we kind of know. We ignore the small voice that says, this is wrong, or something is missing, or we can rationalize this away by saying it's near enough and we'll get to it later. These are normal human weaknesses, but it's sensible to recognize them, that they are danger signs. Complacency is a less pardonable reason for self-deceit. Just turning the handle and pushing out the same old stuff as the world changes around you makes you, your produce, and possibly you, redundant to the good operation of your organization. Even this is not quite as unforgivable as the false confidence that comes from cockiness. Of course, I've covered everything. I have complete visibility of the risk horizon, perfect risk management information, and pinpoint precision on my risk quantification. If you believe all of these things, then you're probably a fool, and there's not much I or anyone else can do to help you. But if you believe even some of them, then maybe now's a good time to go away and have a really good think about how true this could actually be. Okay, sin number three, lying to yourself. Sin number four, lying to other people. Now, risk managers do not, in my experience, deliberately go into meetings planning to lie. That being said, risk managers are human, and as such, while they may not want to lie, circumstances can draw them to exaggerate or to understate, to obfuscate, to prevaricate, and let's say, dissemble. And ultimately, all of this misleads. Now, maybe this is not strictly lying under the law, but then that's not strictly the point. The point is to provide the most accurate information we can. And oddly, the main impulse drawing risk managers to lie is nothing grand or sinister. It's simply the desire not to look stupid. This can start with a simple desire to please. We try to please because we want to be useful. We want to be loved. We want people to be happy. In a perfect world, we achieve these things by doing exactly what is needed and by doing it in a way that is comprehensible and actionable. And what we provide is received by people who judge it without prejudice and who will not blame us for bad news or penalize us for something that cast their plans or their achievements in an unfavorable light. It would be nice to live in a world like that. In the real world, however, this is rarely possible. So we may end up oversimplifying or professor, professing greater certainty than is actually possible. Understandable, we may also stray a little to the dark side when we indulge a misunderstanding in a meeting because it's just too hard to correct the error that discussions moved on or the mis misunderstanding isn't critical to the immediate question. Mostly harmless. Mostly. The desire not to know, look stupid runs pretty deep and with the risk information we often deal with questions for which there are no simple answers. The temptation to mask known uncertainties in order to provide clarity can be strong, and I use provide clarity in inverted commas there. Masking inadequacies, inadequacies in our data and methodology are worse in our own efforts 
can lead us to temptations of blinding our audience with science, particularly in the more quanti areas, or in burying the issues in shovelfuls of numbers, charts, diagrams, and other useful obfuscatory tools. It's also not unknown for risk managers to give the numbers a helpful nudge in the right direction if they're a bit too ambiguous. I tweaked the assumptions here. A little bit of shading on the scores there. Yeah. The hard but important part of our job is the need to provide answers that represent our best understanding and to explain how we got there. Risk managers should be relevant and helpful, but most of all, they should tell the truth. Uh, uh, even, and perhaps particularly when this is hard. So that's sin number four, lying to other people. Seven deadly sins of risk management number five, tunnel vision, only looking at some of the risks. When I started my career in risk management in the city, I was junior enough to believe it was better to shut up about the things I did not understand on the basis that calling them out might expose my ignorance and get me fired. I was also aware of a fairly well-established body of evidence to the effect that even when you were right about something, this doesn't always help if those with authority over you have chosen to believe something different. One of the other things that confused me was that the lion's share of time and effort in risk management was taken up with market risk and credit risk, while operational risk seemed to be regarded as some kind of idiot sibling. Uh, so charming. And of course we love it as much as the others, but, you know, it's a bit vocational, a bit made up, a bit without the rigor and precision of, of the credit and market risk. I found this all the more confusing because operational risk was a term that seemed to be taken to mean all risks except market and credit risk, and perhaps later liquidity risk as well. Of course, I know now this was driv driven by regulation and by a narrow historical origin of risk management within a fairly stable banking world, and also by a movement in e economics that sought to quantify everything and to belittle the importance of anything that couldn't be readily quantified. How could that possibly go wrong? There was an incumbency feedback also, where any change to take greater account of mess, the messy, uncertain, and hard to quantify stuff was likely to be necessarily um, weakening of conclusions to make them less definitive and to affect, the, on that basis, the status, authority, and let's face it, the actual income of those entrusted with managing risk which is always a bit of a disincentive to considered self-examination. We've now reached the point where even the regulators, disproportionately populated by economists as they are, are coming to terms with the fact that everything doesn't quite fit into those neat boxes. It's only taken an epic crash and the near collapse of the global financial system, but I'm sure we all agree that was a price well worth paying for what is needed to help them broaden their outlook. Uh, that being said about the uh, regulators, I think none of us should feel too smug about our ability to see the full picture. There's an element of this kind of bl blindness in most businesses. Perhaps we look at the risks as they were when we started our job, not having ta really taken into account the changes in both the business and the world around us since then. Or we focus on the risks representing our bugbears or the preoccupations of our boards, or even the things we feel most confident talking about. Sometimes we miss risks our peers don't consider, and we, because we just don't want to wander too far from the herd. Sometimes we do, we do not see the entire classes of risk, see entire classes of risk, because we fail to take advantage of fresh perspectives and new knowledge from outside our field. A good start to addressing this is to realize that we all have these vices, and we need to consciously and continually make efforts to address them. A helpful hint is. If you find that your risk management work feels a bit mechanistic and repetitive, it's probably a sign you've narrowed your scope a bit too much. Maybe you're not thinking about it enough. Maybe it's time to start breaking out of the tunnel. That was sin number five, tunnel vision. Sin number six, lack of coordination, failure to join the dots. This is, to a certain extent, the converse of sin number one, which was about mistaking non-risk management activities for actual risk management. This is more about failing to coordinate real risk management activities, even if they're not badged as such. It's also about failing to get full value from those activities as part of a comprehensive and coherent approach to understanding and mitigating the risk to your organization. 
It's about letting things fall through the cracks. So uh, what kind of activity should be brought together to create a more comprehensive approach to risk management? I'd say the following list is a starting point. Firstly, cybersecurity and the broader areas of IT risk management. Now, these can also be held pretty close by IT departments who will discourage you to get too involved, often by hiding behind walls of obfuscation and technical jargon. My advice in this is to persist. Many things labeled cyber or IT risk really have a significant operational or cultural element, and you have a responsibility for these things. Secondly, business continuity and incident management, including the management of messages after an incident. If these aren't already in the risk realm, then you should really start working on them soon. They are important. Thirdly, and, and perhaps when you, unexpectedly, uh, insurance. It's easily overlooked as a risk management view, but a risk management view on insurance can help determine which policies are really doing useful work in protecting the organization. It's also the case that an insurance understanding of your risk register can help where insurance products are available as mitigants. Uh, my final area on this short list is the whole range of ethics, sustainability and governance. The management of these, which can be scattered through legal, CSO and other teams, feeds directly into an organization's ability to steer its culture and in a way that can have a, a significant impact on the actual management of risks. So why don't these things get coordinated naturally? Sometimes it's an incompatibility of terminology. We talk about risk, someone else talks about resilience, some talk about health and safety. Sometimes there are differences in backgrounds in, between the teams can create an inability to pull together or a ha you know, something that hampers good communication. A lot of risk managers are accountants, for example. Your resilience people may have a police background. Your insurance people may be actuaries. Your health and safety people may have an operations background. However, it should be said that more often than not, the big things stopping good coordination are standard corporate inertia and the default organizational problem of just thinking in silos. This is my area. These risk management activities don't have to be controlled by the risk function, although they can be. But in any case, there should be coordination and how it should be done should fit your organization. It may be through an ongoing informal cooperation or through a cycle of meetings or through the activities of a risk committee. The important thing is that it gets done. That was number six, failing to join the dots. So on to sin number seven, the Department of Business Prevention, Dr. No, and Prevet forgetting what risk management is for. I think this final sin is probably the most grievous. One of the worst things that can happen to risk management in an organization is that it turns into, or at least is seen to have turned into, the Department of Business Prevention, the place where new ideas go to die. In the end, it is easy to say no, and risk managers rarely get any credit when business initiatives succeed, but and can take some fire when things go wrong. On this basis, it seems rational to be negative about everything. No chance of getting blamed if, if nothing new is done. Of course, this means your organization misses some opportunities, even some good ones, where a sensible balance of risk and reward would have got the green light. But it really is also bad news for you as a risk manager, because after a while people start to realize that you always say no, so things just go ahead without you and your voice counts for less and less. It even means that your good advice is ignored and risks are taken unnecessarily. But I think the worst thing about it, in frank, frank, frank terms, is that You've probably missed the point of your job if this is happening. Risk management should be a part of management. Good risk management works with management to strengthen ideas and not to shoot them down. Good risk management thinks about their responsibility in supporting the growth and the prosperity of a business. A good risk manager provides clear information so that balanced decisions can be made within the boundaries the business has set itself. That is to say within its risk appetite, whether you call it the, that or not, or whether it's been formally documented or not. If risk management is considered as a serious part of business, you have to think about the role for the upside too. It's a balancing act. Your job is not to say no, and not to be just, oh, I'm part of the checks and balances, 
So the being negative is part of my role. I'm just balancing out the crazy optimism of the sales or the strategy or the marketing people. Your job is to give the best evaluation possible of the, the risks your organization faces. Not to do so is a rotten, lazy abdication responsibility. If risk management is to get a seat with the grown-ups, then the risk managers have to step up, and this means you. And finally, I hope you enjoyed this, or at least like the photos. I take my risk management very seriously, and if you want to talk to me about it, then you have my email addresses here and where I publish the short bio on the following slide. Thanks for your attention, and uh, good luck with risk management.